All right, gentlemen, let's go ahead and pull it together here this morning. Good to see you all. I know we were off last week um, for the Good Friday Easter weekend, which, just speaking for myself, I was very grateful for. It was kind of a busy weekend last weekend, uh, but it's good to be back today. I know we've got three weeks left here in the anthropology study, then we'll take a break for a little bit and come back in June with a, a great study that I'm, I'm very much looking forward to um, as it relates to, again, doctrines of sanctification and now discipleship, how we can help other people along in their sanctification. So more information on that in the weeks to come, but just know that we are wrapping it up here, and I'm looking forward forward to making a strong finish with you here as we get down towards the end of our time, okay? Let me pray for us, and then we'll jump off on in, and I'll explain what we're doing here today. Father, we do thank you um, for your word, for your truth, for your revelation of yourself and your plans for us. Lord, thank you for the clarity that you've given to us so that we do not need to be men who are confused. Instead, we're able to know Christ and uh, the, the reality of what he has made possible now uh, in our relationship with you. Without him, we are nothing, but because of him, now we can know and behold the glory of who you are. And we are so grateful for that. I pray that today we would walk in the light of who Christ is, that his spirit would be formed within us, and that we would be responsive to that work. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I felt a little bit like on Sunday we had jumped off into what could be called affectionately the, the deep end. Um, and so I thought this morning it might be helpful to bring some clarity to that and jump into the deeper end. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of kidding. Um, I, I, I do want to um, go back and just through some of the theological foundations for some of the things that we were covering on Sunday. Uh, and, and bring some clarity to that for all of you. I know coming out of Sunday morning, that was really new territory for a lot of folks. Um, and I got a lot of questions about what does this mean and what about this and what about that? How do these things fit together? And so this morning, I wanted to try to answer some of those questions. Uh, and in God's providence, we were already scheduled. I don't know if you men saw my email or not. Probably didn't. That's okay. Um, that in two weeks, um, at which, well, I guess that would be now next week, a week from today, we were scheduled to do a lesson on the nature of death and the afterlife anyway. Uh, and when I looked at that, I thought, well, let's just move that to this week since that's where we've all been thinking in light of Sunday anyway and just talk about it. And then we'll do the, the, the lecture on government, politics, and how that impacts the Christian next week. So we're just kind of flip-flopping the weeks and that works out really well uh, in line with where we've been here over um, the past couple days in light of things on Sunday, okay? So I, I really do want to do everything I can to try to get to some of your questions here this morning as it relates to Sunday. So if you've just got burning questions that you think would be helpful for the whole group to hear, thinking of those, um, and we'll try to make sure that we leave some time for that, okay? But today I do want to talk about biblical perspective on death, on the afterlife, and kind of give an overview of that, bring some clarity perhaps to what we were talking about about on Sunday um, and, and see what we can do there. Now, I will tell you, gentlemen, that, that there are things in this conversation that we can know with certainty because God's word clearly reveals those things. That would be information such as the reality of an afterlife, um, the denial of a doctrine of soul sleep, for instance, um, the, the, the presence of a literal place called hell and another place called heaven. Those are things that, that we know we don't negotiate upon. They're divinely revealed truths that are very clear to us. But then how those pieces fit together, there's not quite the same level of clarity necessarily. And so there are things that we believe based upon our ability to put the pieces together as we do theology with the data points that God has given to us. How do these pieces fit together? Well, this would be the way that they seem to fit together. And therefore that's what we believe is true. But, but we don't hold to that with the same dogma that we would with just divinely revealed doctrine doctrine, um, such as the, the existence of a place like hell itself, um, for example. Uh, and then there are things where we just simply don't know, right? We can speculate, but it's important to um, acknowledge that we are speculating when we are speculating, okay? And so I want to make sure that we're being clear to do that as well. And so this morning, our, our conversation may, based upon your questions, um, venture off into the realm of speculation. I'm going to try to be as careful as I can to denote that which is speculative versus that which is relatively certain versus
versus, versus that which is divinely revealed. Okay, and we'll we'll try to make sure that we that we do that as we go through. But I want to make sure that. Um, those categories are laid out, um, that not all of this is stuff that we can just say, we know for sure. No, some of it is we know for sure, some of it is we think, some of it is we don't know, but you know, this is best guess, um, and that's the nature of this conversation as we put these pieces together. All right, fair enough? Yep. All right, with that disclaimer in mind, let's jump into some definitions here this morning. I've got a couple of charts, some pictures that I'm gonna go through with you. If you skip ahead and you're looking at those and you feel overwhelmed and confused, stop it. Um, I'll walk you through it in a few minutes, okay? Because whenever you, I see a chart, it's like, wait, what is happening here? Uh, you just need some orientation to that. So we'll do that in a minute, but I want to get through some important definitions here on the front end, okay? Let's start with death. What is death? And you think, well, death is, you know, pretty clear. I know what death is, uh, but there's a lot more nuance to it. And, and guys, there is a lot more nuance to this entire conversation than perhaps you might have first given it credit for. Um, we've all been pre-programmed to think that <clears throat> what is the afterlife? Well, life after death is pretty simple. Either you believe and you go to heaven or you don't believe and you go to hell. That's it, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and that's what we believe. And in a nutshell, that, that's accurate. But there's a lot more nuance to life after death than just heaven or hell. Um, and whether or not, you know, you believe or didn't believe, there, there's a lot of different kind of moving parts to that afterlife and stages to it that uh, the scriptures do very clearly allude to uh, as it relates to resurrections. And when does resurrection happen? And uh, does resurrection happen for different groups of people at different, at different times? Um, and, and what is the eternal destiny and experience of those who have denied Christ? Um, you know, there, there's a lot of different moving parts to that that I want to get into here today to bring perhaps a little bit of that nuance to your awareness um, because a lot of that was really in the background of what it was we were talking about on Sunday. And I want to make sure that that uh, level of clarity is there for all of you men. All right, so death. Um, there are multiple different kinds of death. Death is not just I take my last breath and now I'm dead. No, the scriptures talk about three different kinds of death specifically. Death can simply be defined as the separation of that which was not intended for separation. Okay, we were not created to die. We were created to live forever. In God's original design and intention for creation, death was not something that was included in the original creation. All right, death is the separation, the disconnection of two things that were not intended to be disconnected or separated, which is why death is so final and so very painful from our perspective, okay? Because these things were not intended to be separated. So what are those different kinds of death? Well, the first one is spiritual death. That's the first kind of death. And because of Adam's fall, you and I are dead, spiritually speaking, from the point of our conception. So we are born dead in a spiritual sense, all right? When we enter into this life, when we are conceived in sin, my mother conceived me, which means that we enter into life spiritually dead. And that spiritual death took place in our forefather, Adam, before us. And now every single human being who's ever been born and made alive physically starts out that physical life spiritually dead. Spiritual death can be defined as the separation of your spirit from God. You were designed to live your life in connectivity, spiritually, between you and God. But because of Adam's fall, because of total depravity, we've already covered that, your spirit is now separate from God. You were made to be living in connection to him, but because of sin, you now live in separation from him. That's spiritual death. The flip side of that is spiritual life, which is what comes to you by faith when you believe in Jesus Christ. And that's a current reality that is realized by faith. Are we spiritually dead or are we spiritually alive in this room? I sure hope so. Okay, good morning. You are awake. We are spiritually alive. Why? Because we have believed in Jesus Christ and he has restored us to a condition now of spiritual life that we possess based upon faith. But the day is coming when that spiritual life will go from being something that we believe by faith and will be able to see with our eyes. Okay? That spiritual life will become a reality that will one day become sight. 
But that's the first kind of death, spiritual death. Second kind of death is physical death. So if spiritual death is the separation of your spirit from God, physical death is the separation of your, your body from your spirit. Two things that were never intended to be separate are now separated when you die physically. Okay, your body and your soul become separated, all right? In a fallen condition, uh, your body now, when it goes down into the grave, your spirit is separated from your body, which you can see in a place like Genesis 3, 35, 18 through 19, um, where it talks about, I think it's Rachel's spirit there departing from her body. Um, there is a, there's a separation at physical death of your spirit and your body. So in a fallen condition now, your body is going to be restored to a glorified condition at the resurrection. Okay, the point of the resurrection is ultimately that your body is going to be glorified, raised up, glorified, and reunited with your spirit for all of eternity in a glorified state. That's the significance of the resurrection. It's the overcoming of physical death. It's the second kind of death. Third kind of death is what we can call eternal death, okay? Which is now the separation of both your body and your spirit from God forever. And that's described in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, after the final judgment, uh, where those who had, you know, Satan, his evil f angels, and all of humanity who has followed after him and not believed in Christ are now cast into the lake of fire, where they, both body and soul, are now separated from God forever. And that's what the definition of eternal death is. The flip side of that is eternal life which Peter tells us eternal life has already been secured for you in heaven. You have a right to expect it and hope in it. You will realize that eternal life upon your physical death as you step into the presence of God. Uh, and that eternal life will then be fully completed when your body is resurrected and you physically, spiritually will be united with God forever. That's the definition of eternal life versus eternal death which is defined as the separation of body and spirit from God forever. Okay, three kinds of death. Yes, sir. United does not mean part of. Correct? Yeah, correct. So it doesn't become. It doesn't mean you become part of God. So yes. Okay. It means that you are in Christ eternally. Good. Okay. All right. Clear as mud. Three kinds of death. What are they? Spiritual, physical, eternal. Very important to understand. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. I'm going to get into that very quickly here. Okay. So let me, let me, let me plow ahead through these definitions. All right. <clears throat> so next definition here, and then we'll get there. That's a great question. Um, Sheol, Hades, place of the dead. All three of those words are referring to the same location. Sheol and Hades and the place of the dead, that's, that, that, those are three ways of essentially saying the same thing. Okay? I believe, what I was presenting on Sunday, that I'll cover with you here in a second, that in Sheol, Hades, the place of the dead, prior to the work of Christ, there were, we, we'll call it two compartments. Okay? There's paradise on the one hand, and there is hell on the other. Paradise, Abraham's bosom, two different ways to describe the same idea. It's a place of rest and comfort where Old Testament saints went as they awaited the completion of Christ's work. And I believe you see a picture of that in Luke chapter 16. On the other hand, okay, which is also a part of Sheol or Hades or the place of the dead, you have hell or it's alternatively called the place of torments, or in some passages like 2 Peter 1, it's called Tartarus, um, a place of fire, torment, where evil spirits, unbelievers are consigned while they await the final judgment. Okay? Paradise at the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ is emptied of all of the Old Testament saints that were awaiting his, the completion of his work, and all of those saints are then taken up with him into heaven, 
where he becomes the forerunner of salvation, opens the doors to heaven, and now all of those Old Testament saints, Ephesians 4, 8, 9, and 10, follow in his wake in the victory parade. And now, because his work is completed, when we die, we don't go to paradise in the grave in Sheol. Now we just follow directly in the train of Christ on into heaven, just as all those Old Testament saints already have. So paradise, the portion of paradise within the grave today, it's emptied out, I believe, okay? Because of the work of Christ that has opened the way for all into heaven. And so when we die, we now instantly follow on in that train right into his presence. Hell, which is the, uh, another part of the grave, Sheol, is it currently full or empty? Full, okay? It is full and it is being filled. All right, that portion of Sheol is still very much alive and in force. And whenever anybody dies, apart from belief in Christ, they go into hell, which is also a place of waiting for the final judgment. And at the end of the end times, after the millennial kingdom, there is what's called the great white throne judgment, where God is going to raise up the bodies of every unbeliever who has ever died, and he's going to reunite the souls which have been in hell with the bodies of those unbelievers, and they will be resurrected as well, to a resurrection of what's called judgment. And they then, body and soul now reunited, will be cast into the lake of fire forever. And that is their eternal destiny. So both hell and paradise are both temporary holding places for different kinds of people. And both hell and paradise are within Sheol or Hades, that realm of the dead. At the resurrection, ascension of Christ, paradise is emptied out. In the final judgment at the end of human history, hell will be emptied out. And what you will have is heaven, which is the throne room of God. Heaven is wherever the throne of God is on the one hand, and you will have the lake of fire on the other hand. Okay, that's very brief overview, but I wanna make sure that those definitions are clear. Okay, the lake of fire is the permanent place of perpetual punishment for sin, sinners, Satan, and evil spirits, and it's defined by the total absence of God's goodness, okay? Um, some people say hell is defined by total separation from God and the total absence of God. And I would say that's mm, close, but the reality is the fullness of God's wrath and holiness is very much alive in hell. And what's, it, it's what makes hell, the lake of fire so awful is that it is the permanent perpetual experience of God's wrath, justice, holiness, being poured out upon sin and sinners for all of eternity. Okay, so hell, I think better definition is to say that it is the absence of God's goodness um, and all of the attributes that go along with his goodness, his mercy, his grace, his love, his compassion, his kindness. Um, those things are not present in hell in that way. Correct, and that we call that common grace, okay? So those are some very important definitions here for this conversation. Just want to make sure that that's clear. So if you guys have um, on the back page there of your notes, there is a page that's called the compartmental theory of the afterlife. I know, um, um, I know that this can be a little bit confusing, but a picture is better than a thousand words. So let me go ahead and just give you a picture of what it is that I'm talking about. All right, um, guys, I made the mistake of um, not asking for this to be put on the slides. And so I'm sorry for that. So I, you've got it in front of you. I've got it in front of me. Um, and that's on me. There was a disconnect here when we made the slideshow. Um, so I, 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 I apologize for that, but we'll be able to get through here. No problem. A uh, different way. Okay, so you've got that compartmental theory of the afterlife. Now, we call this theory, okay? This is one of those places where we say this is not divinely revealed dogma and doctrine, but this is what we believe based upon the pieces of information and the evidence that, that we have, All right? So I want to go through this together with you because this is, this is what I was teaching you on Sunday. This is what I believe is an accurate reflection of the biblical data given the pieces that are available to us, all right? 
on the left side of that page. You can see it there at the top of the page. It says, place of departed before the ascension of Christ. On the right side of the page, place of departed after the ascension of Christ. So that vertical line with the arrow there represents the ascension of Jesus Christ from this earth back into heaven. All right. On the left side of that line, so the, okay, so that's that. The, the horizontal line in the very middle of the page represents life on this earth. Everything below the line indicates life in the grave. Okay? So what we're saying here is that before the ascension of Christ, if you died as an Old Testament saint and went into the grave, you went below the line, you went into paradise or what's called Abraham's bosom, which is separated by a great gulf, Luke 16, 26 says, from hell, the place of torments, Tartarus, where the evil spirits are kept into prison. So two different parts of the grave, paradise on the one hand, hell on the other. You can see that there below the line. You've got paradise and you've got the place of torments separated by a great gulf from one another. At the point of the ascension, paradise and that great gulf between them become defunct and go out of existence because they're emptied out. There's no longer any purpose for them. But hell continues on. You can see as you go across the bottom of the page there, the place of torments continues on all the way until you get to the lake of fire over on the very right hand side of the page. You see that there? Okay. Um, so today, what does that mean? It means... <clears throat> That if you die in a condition of wickedness outside of Christ, your body goes into the grave and your spirit goes into that place of torments. You can see that they're right in the dead center of the page. Okay, that's, that's basically representing you and me. You see that? Those two little stick figures? Don't you love stick figures? I love stick figures. Right in the middle of the page. Okay, the wicked... Their body goes to the grave and their spirit goes to hell, the place of torments, to await the final judgment. Right? That's what happens to those who die outside of Christ. But then look over at the righteous person there just to the left. Okay, the person who is in Christ, who has believed in Christ, where do they now go? Do they go into paradise? No. Where do they go? Heaven, 2 Corinthians 5, to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. And so their body goes into the grave to await the final resurrection, but their spirit goes straight to heaven because of the work that Christ has already done. Okay? So that's, that, that's to bring some, some clarity there for you. Okay? And then our spirit is in heaven. There will come a point of resurrection when our body will be resurrected and reunited with our spirit, but our spirit is with God in heaven until the point of resurrection, which I hope to get into here with you in a couple of minutes. Okay, any questions about this chart, this picture specifically? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the reason why Ab paradise is called Abraham's bosom that's a Jewish description that Jesus uses in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16 is the only place where it's called Abraham's bosom because all of the um, Jewish people prior to Christ were looking forward to going and being with Abraham as he is receiving the benefits of the promises that have been made to him. And so the, the, the parable there in Luke 16, it's very interesting. Lazarus, the poor man, he, it's not said that he goes to heaven. Nowhere is it said that he goes to God. Where is he? He's there with Abraham, having a conversation with Abraham, being comforted by Abraham, that the fruition of all the promises that God has made to me will be granted to you, and we are here together awaiting the final fulfillment of those promises together. And so Abraham is pictured as being a, a comforter. You know, so um, Abraham is drawing Lazarus to himself saying, you know, never fear, the promises will be fulfilled. Here we are together, look, we're not there with the wicked, we're here with the righteous, Christ will come and redeem us. Okay, so that would be the origin of the phrase. Yeah. Would, would it be safe to say you kind of laid out three categories of dogma, and then something where you can build a pretty biblical, solid biblical case yeah. for it. Uh, but, you know, it's not necessarily something held dogmatically. Right. And there's the 
really wide open speculation. Would it be safe to say that Abraham, this understanding of Abraham's bosom would be more in that middle category? Yes. Yeah. As I, as I said, um, this, that's why we call this the compartmental theory of the afterlife. This is not doctrine or dogma. This is our best ability to put together all the biblical data points. And so I believe this. This is not speculative. I believe this, but there's no ability to say with certainty, this is exactly the way it is. This is our best effort to put all the pieces together. So this is in that middle category. Because some theologians think that Abraham's bosom actually could be heaven, paradise. Correct. Heaven. Yeah, some theologians would say Abraham's bo bo bosom could be heaven. I would not affirm that. And there's about 12 reasons why they're in your notes. Okay, reasons why we affirm the compartmental theory. And I think you put all those things together. I don't know if we've got time to do that, but I wanted you to have them this morning. Um, you put all those reasons together, and I think there's a pretty compelling case to be made for this as opposed to the alternative, which um, is that they just went to heaven. But you gotta, you know, you got to deal with all of these different statements that are here in Scripture if, if you believe that, which I, I don't see a clear understanding of apart from this explanation. Okay? Oh yeah, there's lots. So um, this, <clears throat> this kind of compartmental theory of, you know, Sheol. So in the Old Testament, you've got all these Old Testament saints who are all saying, I'm going down to Sheol. And if you look at the divinely revealed information about heaven specifically, I, I looked at a list this week, 98% of our information from heaven all comes from the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there are almost no descriptions of heaven outside of Ezekiel and Daniel's visions of the place. Everybody's expectation is that I'm going to go, they call it, down to the grave, right? Which is very different from the New Testament expectation that I'm going to go up into heaven and the city of God. And then in the New Testament, there's this explosion of information about what heaven is like. Jesus very clearly says in John 3, John 3, 13, no one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended the son of man. Um, after his res resurrection, Jesus says to um, Mary, you know, don't cling to me in this way for I have not yet ascended to my father. Um, this is the reason why he says to that second thief on the cross, Luke 23, 43, today I will be with you in paradise, okay, which is very consistent with that Old Testament expectation um, that I'm going to go down to the grave and await my final salvation based upon the work of Christ, okay. So there's just a lot of different data points there that I would point to and say I think that that all is in the category of affirming this picture that I'm, I'm providing you here with, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, the, the scriptures talk about, so the, the Hebrew word for heaven is, I believe, Shemayim, um, which is used alternatively to describe multiple different places, okay? So there's the heavens, um, which would be like the sky, and then there's the greater heavens, which would be like outer space where the planet, planets are, and then there's the third heaven, which is the place where God resides that's above the sky and space, then there's heaven proper. But in, in, in the Hebrew and even in the Greek language a little bit, um, those three locations are all combined into the heavens. So God creates the heavens, plural, sky, space, heaven, and the earth. Okay, so you've got first, second, third heaven. See what I mean when I say this is a little bit more complex and nuanced than just hell and heaven? Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, not synonymous. The word Abaddon means destruction. And so I would say that, you know, in Job 26, I think is where he talks about Abaddon and Sheol tightly connected. Um, Abaddon is the place of destruction, which is in Sheol. It's a portion of Sheol known as hell, place of torments. Um, and that's where the unbelieving souls go upon separation from their body. Okay. Um, and that's, I quoted that text on Sunday because, you know, that's, it's in that context that 
uh, we're told that um, Sheol, you know, because of the Abaddon, the portion of Sheol known as Abaddon is naked in the sight of God because Jesus, we're told in 1 Peter 3, goes there and proclaims victory over them. They've got nothing to hide. There's no place for them to hide. Christ is victorious and he sees them and says, I've won, right? Chart's up there now. Hey, look at that. Okay, that's, guys, thank you. You're my heroes, super helpful. Okay, very good. That's so much better, okay? Any other questions about this kind of compartmental theory of the afterlife? Yeah. So, the great gulf, is that where the uh, Catholics get their theory of purgatory? No, that comes from the talk about, I think it's just a separation. Yeah, so, all right. <clears throat> so, <laughs> so um, there's a lot of people, critics, who would say, I, I don't affirm the, this, this kind of compartmental theory of the afterlife prior to Christ, because that's essentially what the Catholic Church teaches, and I'm, I'm not going to base my understanding based upon Catholic doctrine. But, but my answer to that is, well, there's many ways in which the Catholic Church has capitalized upon a pre-existing doctrine. Um, so the origin of this compartmental theory comes from the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament as the Jewish rabbis and teachers, many of whom were faithful, were trying to make sense out of what, does, what do our Bibles, which at that point, just the Old Testament, have to say about life after death. And the only way that they can come up with to make sense of it is this two compartment theory of Sheol, that there's a portion of it where the wicked go, there's a portion of it where the righteous go. Um, because we're told that a portion of it is for judgment, but then David says, but I'm going to go there. And we know David wasn't judged or Abraham wasn't judged. So how do we make sense of this? Two compartments. You say, well, is that true? That's where I look at it and say, well, Luke 16. Okay. Jesus literally takes that structure, uses it in a parable. I have a really hard time believing that Jesus would do theology with a completely fictionalized made up account. So is Luke 16 a parable? Yes, there, there are parabolic aspects to it, but he's not completely making this up. He wouldn't do that in an area where we have no other information. Um, the structure of how that grave picture is presented in Luke 16 has to inherently be theological. Now, I'm not building my theology based upon a parable. That's a big hermeneutical no-no. Okay, but I do believe that that parable affirms the understanding that would be the historic understanding. Early church then sees the regular teaching of Old Testament experts, sees the affirmation of Jesus, and they now, uh, men like uh, Tertullian, Justin Martyr would affirm this, so the early church fathers would affirm this. Now the Catholic Church comes onto the scene, they take that doctrine, and now there's all sorts of unique and novel things that are extra biblical that are put into this picture, like purgatory, okay? So the doctrine of purgatory would essentially say, everybody goes down here into this place of torments, and based upon whether or not you've got people doing penances and baptisms for the dead, and based upon your work while you're in this place, um, or you're in this great gulf, for instance, um, that, that, that's where they would go, the great gulf, where you've got the ability to either be pulled up by your bootstraps out of, the, out of purgatory, out of the great gulf, and into paradise, right? Or if you're not doing what you should be doing, then your soul's gonna drop off into, into hell, into the place of torments, okay? And that's the condition that they would call limbo or that they would call purgatory. And we would just simply say, there is no biblical basis for that kind of a belief or a doctrine. It is appointed once to man to die, Hebrews 9, and after that, boom, comes judgment. Either judgment to life or judgment to death, but there's no opportunity to change your fate once you've gone to the grave. Okay, so we would, we would not affirm that. That is a later doctrinal, I would call it deviant direction that is founded upon some of this understanding of the afterlife, but is not at all consistent with biblical teaching. Okay, clear? All right. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, so the, the, the Jewish view of this does not affirm the work of Christ. And so everybody still goes into either paradise or into hell 
based upon who they are, and they're awaiting not the second coming of Christ, they're waiting for the first coming of the Christ, right? The Messiah. And when he comes, then, you know, we, they will be in the presence of God, um, or if, they've deny, if they denied him, they'll be consigned to hell forever, okay? So that would be very different, all right? There, there's, none of, there's none of this happening. It's all that or that. Okay, good questions. Others? Yeah, Ryan. Yes. So the unborn that have died, the Catholic Church would teach that the unborn kind of go down into this realm of the dead. Okay. I would say today, based on a number of different biblical texts that we really don't have time to get into necessarily, each one of them or build a full case for this. But an unborn child who has never had the opportunity to repent, and even very young children who do not have the capacity to understand the gospel, and special needs people who do not have the ability to process life or the, the fundamentals of the gospel, in the mercy of God, when they die, he takes them directly into his presence in heaven. That is my very firm conviction and belief, which I could explain to you maybe another time. But I don't believe that unborn children go down here into a waiting pool or into hell. No, they're taken up directly into the presence of God based upon the work of Christ. Prior to Christ, they would have gone to paradise, Abraham's bosom, awaiting the work of Christ, at which point um, they ascend with Christ into God's presence. Primary argument that I would make for that is that there is the statement in Revelation 5 that people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every group of people are going to praise God in heaven someday. Well, how is that possible when there are multiple tribes, nations, groups, and tongues who have never even heard the gospel? Well, the only way that that can be fulfilled is if God has done a work through his grace and mercy to bring people to himself and allow them entrance into heaven based upon the work of Christ, those who were never given the opportunity to reject him and rebel or believe and repent. Okay, I think that's a pretty strong argument. Uh, correct. It is through the work of Christ on their behalf that that, that, that entrance is made but they're, they're never given the opportunity to cling to Christ, right? But once, someone come, once somebody becomes aware of their sinfulness um, and they pursue and embrace that sinfulness, apart from Christ, not, now there's a condemnation there. Okay, we could, we could spend the rest of our time on that alone, but we won't, okay? I would say that's on the border between first and second. Okay. I don't agree with that viewpoint. Sure. Yeah, we'll talk about it later, okay? We don't have time to get into that this morning, all right? Yes, sir. What about cremation? Cremation? Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> let's flip the page. Okay, on the next page, what you'll see there is a schematic of future judgments and resurrections, all right? Now, this gets a little bit complicated, but let me walk you through it, all right? Don't get overwhelmed. Guys, thank you so much. This is so much better having this up here, okay? Let me look. All right, so <clears throat> Christ comes, okay? Um, well, let me do it this way. Definitions first, okay? Key points of the resurrection. Christ's resurrection is the resurrection that enables every other resurrection. And you can see Christ's resurrection there in the middle, okay? His resurrection is the enabling force that now enables every other resurrection. We believe, based upon the teaching of Scripture, that there will be two categories of resurrections. Jesus in John 5, 28 and 29 calls the first category, get this, it's very simple and clear, praise God, the first resurrection. Okay, and then there's also what's called the second resurrection. The first resurrection is a resurrection to life. The second resurrection is what's called a resurrection to judgment. Everybody gets a resurrection. Everybody, every human being who has ever lived will be resurrected. Everyone. Okay. The only question is, will you be part of the first resurrection to life or the second resurrection to judgment? You say, well, how do those work? Well, the first resurrection to life comes in two distinct phases. Okay. The first phase is the resurrection of the church saints which comes in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, where Paul says, don't fear those who have gone before you in the church who have died in Christ 
will be raised first before you're raptured, then you will be raptured off the earth and together we will meet the Lord in the air, both the dead and those who are living at the time of Christ's return, at the point of the rapture. Okay, and so that's phase 1A. Church saints are resurrected when Christ returns to gather and collect his church at the point of the rapture. Right, that's when we, if I die today, my grand, let's use my grandfather, he's dead. When is he going to be resurrected? My grandfather will be resurrected at the rapture when Christ comes to gather the church off this planet in preparation for the end times. That's the first phase of the resurrection. You say, well, what about Israel? Those who aren't part of the church specifically. When will they be resurrected? And what about believers who come to Christ during the tribulation period and die during the tribulation period after the church has been raptured? When are they resurrected? Well, there's a different point of resurrection for them. That's phase 1b. Okay, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints. We're told in Revelation 20 that that comes at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. All right, so let me show this to you. So right now, <clears throat> we are in between these two lines right here. You see that? Okay, Christ's resurrection, the one that makes all the, all, of the resurre all, all of the resurrections possible. And then you've got the resurrection of the believers in the church that takes place at, at the beginning of Christ's second coming, the rapture. Christ comes into the clouds to gather up his own. And all of the church people who are still alive are raptured up to meet him in the air. First Thessalonians is very clear about that. First Thessalonians 4. But along with us come the bodies of all of those believers. So we are, if we're alive and remain, we will be bodily raised up to meet Christ in the air. And all of the bodies of New Testament believers will also be raised up and brought to heaven with Christ. Where we will receive a, the judgment of Christ, where he will give us gifts and evaluate um, our activity upon the earth. 2 Corinthians 5 talks about judgment for believers. So we are resurrected to life, and during the period of the tribulation, we are, um, we are at the judgment seat of Christ being given um, rewards and gifts for all of our faithfulness to him. That's not a judgment of wrath. It's not a judgment to fear. It's a resurrection to new life and the judgment of Christ's grace in heaven. Okay. When then do all these Old Testament saints get resurrected? Well, their spirits, where are their spirits right now? In heaven. Because they went there with Christ from paradise at the point of his ascension. So their spirits are already in heaven. But when do their bodies join those spirits in heaven? Well, very clearly in Revelation, the whole point of the tribulation period here is that God turns his attention back to the nation of Israel. And therefore, all the bodies of those who were part of the nation of Israel, who believed in faith, will be resurrected at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Now you see that right there, Revelation 20, verse 4, over here on the right side of your chart. Okay, so their bodies are resurrected at the end of the tribulation, the beginning of the millennium, and that's where their bodies are reunited with their souls. Okay, and now this is now the beginning of what's called the kingdom of God, where the church and Israel are now fully reunited with Christ, inhabiting their souls and their bodies having been rejoined, and they're now united with Christ forever. Okay. Which is distinct now, Revelation 20, 30, 2013, from the resurrection of the wicked. This is the second resurrection, where everybody who has died throughout the entirety of human history apart from Christ, their bodies are now raised from the grave, reunited with their souls for the purpose of judgment. It's a resurrection not to life, a resurrection to judgment. And it's at that resurrection where they, along with Satan and all of the evil angels, are now cast into the permanent lake of fire, which is where they will spend the rest of eternity. That's the second resurrection, the resurrection of damnation, the resurrection of death, the resurrection of judgment that you find being explained in John 5, 29, which is distinct from the resurrection of life which will happen to us as church saints at the rapture and will happen for all the Old Testament saints at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Okay? I told you we were going from the deep end to the deeper end. 
Okay? Um, does that make sense? Who asked the question about resurrection? Cremation. Cremation. <laughs> yeah. How, how did we get there? Okay? Um, cremation does nothing to impact any of these resurrections. Okay? Bodies are destroyed all of the time. Bodies are lost at sea and eaten by fish and dispersed throughout the seven oceans, all right? Um, all sorts of things happen to body, bodies. People are burned alive. People are burned in fires. Um, the resurrections do not require a physical intact body in order for them to be raised. Now, the power of God is such that it is able to reassemble and recongregate the body, no matter whether it's fresh fish in a morgue or whether it's been dead for 2,000 years and it's long gone and, and dry as dust. No, the resurrection happens as these bodies are reassembled and reunited with their spirits. That's, that's what we believe. So cremation, my belief, is that it does nothing to impact the status of resurrection. Okay? That was your question. Does that answer it? Okay. Yes, sir. Yep. What was that? No. <laughs> so at the end of all of this, at the conclusion of the millennial kingdom, Christ burns up the entire earth with fire such that all of the elements melt. Okay. And at the end of the millennial kingdom, Christ or Christ will, or God will create what's called the new heavens and the new earth. And then we will then reside there in that, in that new heavens, in that new earth, in that eternal state, in perfection for the rest of eternity. And that's where we, church saints and Old Testament saints, will dwell for the rest of eternity, following the millennial kingdom. We're getting into the deep weeds now of eschatology, which we will cover together at length in a coming term. Okay, so I want to put that disclaimer on here. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, okay. So very quickly here, the church is raptured at the beginning of the tribulation period, which lasts for seven years. We are at the judgment seat of Christ during those seven years and following the judgment seat of Christ, having received our rewards, we are at what's called the marriage supper of the lamb. At the end of that seven year period, we all stand up from the table, wipe our mouths off. And we are told in Revelation 20 that we return with Christ to the earth to, as, as we witness him saving the nation of Israel from final destruction at the battle of Armageddon. Okay, that's very clearly explained in Revelation chapter 20, and we'll get into that later. So the, the church with Christ in heaven at the rapture, we return with Christ at his second coming, Revelation 20. And that's the point at which all Israel is saved and the millennial kingdom is instituted and the resurrection of the Old Testament saints and tribulation saints now takes place. And now every believer from every time has been reunited with their body. Yeah, Charlie. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Rich. Post cross. Yep. Um, so our souls go to heaven. Okay. Are we Correct. put into like a spiritual hard drive or do we have awareness? No, there's definitely awareness. Definitely awareness. To be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. And the New Testament text, there's a hundred of them that talk about, well, there, there's probably more than that, but there's at least a hundred that talk about the glory of heaven and the awareness that we have there. So there is an awareness. Uh, we would not affirm a doctrine of soul sleep. Our bodies go into the grave. Our spirits, our fully cognizant, aware spirits are in heaven instantly with God because of Christ's work. Okay, and I, I would say that that in the Old Testament, there was also a level of awareness in paradise. It's not as though they went to sleep and were just awaiting the work of Christ. No, there's awareness there, and you see that in Luke 16. Okay? So, do not affirm soul sleep. Very much aware, very much alive. Uh, in fact, I would say that there's even recognizability in that spiritual presence in heaven. It's not as though you're some like glowing light that's just there without a body. No, you, you, you are recognizable as you. The reason I say that is because when Samuel comes out of the grave um, in 1 Samuel 28, the witch and Saul instantly recognize him. Ah, that's Samuel. And Saul even says, what does he look like? He says, he's a very old man wrapped in a cloak. 
right? So he's not physically alive. He's there spiritually, but you can recognize exactly who he is, okay? Uh, same thing when Moses and Elijah come back at the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, physically, their bodies are still in their graves, but spiritually, everybody there knows that's Moses, that's Elijah. We recognize them, okay? Yeah. Animals in heaven? Well, there's at least one white horse because Jesus rides it back during the second coming. <laughs> yeah. Be beyond that, speculative. I, yeah, there's a lion and a lamb in the millennial kingdom. So I, generally, yes, but I don't think it's fluffy your dog. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, golden retrievers, not necessarily. So no, animals do not have souls. They do not have spirits. They're not pertinent to the afterlife. Will there be animals that God creates in heaven? Sure, but it won't be your house pet. Okay. Yes, yes. Yep, absolutely. Right. So, so with that, um, recognizing in Revelation 20, New Jerusalem is going to come down. Right. Is there a sense in which there's a compartment that we hold to? Or are we in the new... So let me go back. No. Let me go back to the definition of heaven that we covered at the very beginning. Heaven is wherever God's throne is. So the heaven that we will go to immediately upon death is not the heaven where we will spend eternity because God is going to recreate both the heavens and the earth at the conclusion of the millennial kingdom. So heaven is not like, oh, this is my, this is my, my heavenly crash pad mansion palatial estate now that I'm gonna be in forever when I die. No, heaven is not defined by your presence. Heaven is not defined by your house. Heaven is defined as being God's house. And therefore, wherever God's spirit, wherever the spirit of God, the, the, God the Father, God the Son are inhabiting and, and enthroned, that is heaven. Okay, so there are going to be various forms of heaven in the afterlife. Clear, clear as mud? I'll find out when I get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you will. Okay, because you believe. Yeah. Your, the chart has Old Testament saints resurrected at the same time as the, uh, the saints that went through the tree. Yes, correct. However, I thought the Old Testament saints were, uh, their bodies would go up at the same time as the rapture. No. So I, I would draw a line of distinction there. Um, and that really hinges on the fact that we at New Community Church would be pretty strongly committed dispensationalists, which means we would see a, a, a distinct difference between Old Testament Israel and the church. Okay, so a lot of theologians would combine those and say Israel, the church, replaces Israel and Israel is now the church, we would say, no, these, these are two separate entities that God is working through during di different time periods or dispensations, okay? Their ultimate place of residence is the same. They will all be the kingdom of God, but the church is not the same as Israel, okay? The church is the paradigm of God whereby he brings the Gentiles into his kingdom Israel is his chosen people whereby he advances the plan of salvation through the coming of the Messiah. Um, so, therefore, because they are two distinct entities, um, the best scriptural revelation is that the church is, rapture, the church is resurrected at the rapture. Israel is resurrected at the conclusion of the millennial kingdom, at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, which is where God's plan for them comes to its conclusion. Okay, which is what Daniel 7, Daniel 9 very clearly articulate. And the book of Revelation maps perfectly onto that, which we'll cover at some point down the road. Okay? Yes, sir. Two things. By um, virtue of the fact that the saints are, those in Christ are recognizable. Yep. In Sheol. Right. They're recognizable now. So if I was translated today into heaven, I yep. recognize people as. I believe. So, yes, that, that is speculative, but I believe well-grounded speculation. Um, the other one is, uh, we talk about the, heaven is where God's throne is. The, uh, the context of Jesus when he said, in my house there is. Right. Yeah. I go prepare a place for you. 
there some idea? Yes. De developed idea that there is literally a, a place yeah. for yeah, yeah. So um, I would say go back and listen to the message that we did in John, I think that's 14, um, where we covered that. Um, but specifically, the word there is not there's a mansion waiting for you. Um, it's Jesus' emphasis is don't worry, you're not going to lose your spot. I have a place, like a, 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 a place reserved for every person who, it, who has been chosen and given to me by God. So there is a place distinctly for you reserved in heaven. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's got a particular square footage with a, with a, uh, a, a, a street address. Okay, it's not like its own house. That's not what he's saying. It's, it's a place, right? Um, right, right. Yeah, okay, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say the, the throne of, maybe let me dial that in a little bit, the throne of God the Father. So God the Spirit is resonant within your heart. Does that make your heart heaven? Definitely not, right? Um, so God is, God is within you if you're in Christ, but that doesn't make you heaven. Um, Christ is localized here on the earth during incarnation, but that didn't make this heaven. I'm talking about the throne of God the Father where he resides. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So, the thief on the cross, Jesus told him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Right. But Jesus was not yet resurrected. Correct. The thief very possibly went to... Oh, absolutely. And that's what I, and that's what I was, what, what was proclaiming on Sunday. And how awesome would that be to literally walk through the walk through the, the doors of the grave arm in arm with Jesus, like they arrived at the same time, like together, essentially. And then Jesus immediately walks in. You're the thief. You just got there, and Jesus now looks around and says to everybody in paradise. Now we're speculating. Now, let's go. And he spends all of 36 hours in the place. Like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If I die right now as a believer, yeah. I go to heaven, but I'm still awaiting judgment in the eternal heaven. Yes. So let me let me end with that because I, I did want to end there. Okay. What does all this mean for me? Like what? Like okay. I, I see. Whoa. That's a lot. That's a lot more than just like he, die, go to heaven, go to hell. Like whoa. What what just happened? Okay. Let me chart your course specifically, Aiden Head through the afterlife. I'm assuming you believe. You do, right? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Good. Um, I'm, I'm really glad you said yes right now. So is your dad, by the way. Um, okay, so I die <clears throat> today, okay? I am part of Israel or the church? church? Church. My body goes into the grave, but my spirit immediately goes up into heaven to be with God because of Christ's work. Okay, that's the significance of the ascension, that Christ has now been raised, and therefore my spirit is instantly raised. My body is anticipating a future resurrection, all right? So uh, my spirit with, with Christ in heaven awaiting reunification with my body, which has been buried and is in the grave. At the rapture of the church, my body will be resurrected along with all of the living saints of the church and will be raised up into heaven and my soul will be reunited with now my glorified body. And I, the fullness of me, will now stand before the judgment seat of Christ receiving the rewards for how I lived before him during my time on earth. That's not a judgment to fire or, or, or damnation. No, I'm saved, I'm there, I'm secure. Um, but it's, it's a judgment of rewards, okay? Once those rewards have been divvied out to the entirety of everybody in the church, then you sit down at the marriage supper of the lamb where he says, come, let's rejoice together, okay? At the conclusion of the marriage supper of the lamb, which is at the end of the tribulation period, so this lasts for seven years, I, in soul and body, now come back with Christ as he rides upon his white horse and I witness with my own eyes the battle of Armageddon as Christ slays all of the enemies, of his, all of his enemies and all of Israel's enemies and he now saves all Israel. 
Okay? Now, I'm with Christ during the resulting thousand-year reign of Jesus here upon the earth as he's seated upon the throne of David, ruling with a rod of iron over all the nations. Now, what will I be doing during that period of time? I don't exactly know, but I know that I will be there with him, okay? In, in a glorified body, okay? I cannot die. Um, at the end of the millennial kingdom, that thousand-year reign, we're told that the people, the, 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 the unglorified people who lived through the tribulation period and through the second coming of Christ, they will have had children. Those children will have chosen to rebel against Christ. And uh, there will be a rebellion that Satan instigates at the end of the thousand-year reign. And that's the point at which Christ finally judges all the nations, wipes out the final rebellion, and then there's the resurrection of the dead which does not include me, I've already been resurrected, it includes everybody from Cain all the way through until the end of the millennial kingdom, anybody who has died outside of faith in Christ. Where will I be? I will be a witness of that great resurrection and I will be standing there as a witness of the great white throne judgment as Christ casts all of those people who have, some of whom have been in hell and some of whom are alive there before him at that final rebellion, into the lake of fire forever with Satan and his angels where they will spend the rest of eternity. Then he turns around, burns the whole earth up. I see that happen. And I'm now a witness to his work of new creation as he creates a new heavens and a new earth. And that is now the home that I will live in for the rest of eternity. Okay? Does that make sense? You know where you're going to be? Excellent. Okay, good. Guys, that was a lot. Yeah, Doug. Yes. Yeah. Well said. Okay. Breaking news. Would you lead us in a prayer for the Grant family? Elizabeth had her baby. Oh, yes. I, I will do that. Mike reports that uh, she it was born last night, I guess, or early this morning. Two pounds, 13 ounces, no concerns with him so far. He's in the NICU, Elizabeth in recovery. Surgical team said the C-section went beautifully. Good. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's, let's pray for them. And, Doug, in light of what you said, let's pray uh, for, for this as well, okay? Father, we do thank you for all of this truth. It's deep stuff, but you've given it to us in your word, and you want us to understand it. So that, specifically, the New Testament tells us we might have hope. That's the point of your revelation to us of these things and of the truth of resurrection. So Lord, when we think about this, may we have great hope knowing that because of Christ's work, we will be with you forever through the tumultuous ending of humanity's history. And our witnessing of that is going to resound in our hearts to the praise of your glory as we see exactly what you do to magnify yourself and the work of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray. We do pray for those who are in our lives, who do not know you, who reject the power and the majesty of Christ. Um, their destiny is uh, very clear. Uh, we laid out here before us. And so, Father, we pray that we would have boldness and courage to proclaim the truth to them. We pray for their souls, that you would do your, the work of your spirit within them to bring them truly to yourself. Um, we thank you for that work of Christ, the work of regeneration that we've experienced, and we pray that we would be motivated now to go and make proclamation to those who need to believe. Lord, we thank you as well for the gift of, of new physical life that's been granted to the Grant family uh, here just recently this evening, Lord, or last evening. I know that that's been um, a heavy burden upon their heart over the past six weeks as they've been awaiting this uh, baby to come to full term and all the complications of that pregnancy. So thank you for your kindness to them. Lord, we pray that you would protect that little life two pounds and that as it develops now outside of Elizabeth's womb, that it would be protected and safe. And Lord, we will entrust that life to your care. Thank you for your gut, your goodness, your kindness, 
You've demonstrated yourself to us to be our God. And we're grateful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, that was a lot.